Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Mr. President, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It is with immense pride that I stand before you tonight to pay tribute to a personal friend, teacher, and mentor of 18 years, and a great friend of Detroit, Mr. Max Fisher. By the way, Max, where is my 12-inch riser I negotiated? Only in America is this possible. <laughs> while, my heritage, while my heritage is German, I am an American by choice. My American citizenship is a gift. Mr. President, when your administration took office, this town introduced to you the President of the United States of America. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John Engler, Randolph Agley, Charles Yob, Spence Abraham, and a real chip off the old block, Philip Fisher. And thank you, Heinz Prechter, for that kind introduction and for the great job you and your team and everyone in this hall have done these past eight years. You and Michigan came through for our party in 1980. You and Michigan came through, yes, in 1984. And I'll I bet my bottom dollar you and Michigan will come through again when November 8th rolls around. And that, that's even more true now that someone I know and respect came through for us in all America the other night. I have to say I wasn't surprised. Sure, the Washington establishment was betting against him, but I can tell you the smart money was riding on a great senator by the name of Dan Quayle. I tell you, he got my vote. How about yours? Well, it's a real pleasure to be here for a tribute to a great Detroiter, a great Republican, a great American, Max Fisher. The 
put it simply, the man is a legend. It's been, he's been an advisor, a supporter, and a friend, not only to me, but to dozens and dozens of others who would not have made it very far without Max's guidance. You all know that Max Fisher is an important man, but I'm not sure even you know just how important. I remember when I was here at the Joe Lewis Arena eight years ago for a little party you all probably remember called the Republican National Convention. At that convention, I was honored to receive the Republican nomination for president. And after I finished my delivering my acceptance speech, many of you crowded onto the podium along with my family, my friends, and Republicans who shared in that magical moment. I have to say it was one of the proudest moments of my life. Now, a friend of mine was sitting in a hotel lounge in California watching the proceedings on television and feeling kind of moved, he said. And while he was watching, a fellow who was there turned to him and asked, say, mister, who are all those people up on the podium with Max Fisher? <laughs> well, I didn't really mind. After all, Max is one of the few men who's been around longer than I have. <laughs> Max is a loyal, longtime Republican. In fact, he saw the light a lot earlier than I did. After all, it's no secret I used to be a Democrat before I saw the light. Only when I saw the light, I had to ask Tom Edison, what in the Sam, he does that thing anyway. <laughs> Max has always seen Detroit through its ups and downs, and he's lived to see his city fight back and move forward in no small measure due to his efforts. And today, he has every reason to be proud, because if you ask me, Detroit is America's renaissance city. <laughs> Max has seen them come and seen them go like I have, and I'd wager that he was as impressed as I was by a certain speech given a couple of months ago in New Orleans. It was one of the finest pieces of oratory I've heard, given by one of the finest men I've ever known, a fellow by the name of George Bush. Uh, now, some people want to talk this year, I understand, about competence. Well, I say, fine, let's talk about competence. I just happen to think that the youngest flyer in the Navy with 58 combat missions the Texas wildcatter who made his own way in the world, the Republican congressman from Houston, the chairman of the Republican Party, the de facto ambassador to China, the ambassador to the UN, the director of the Central Intelligence Agency, and the vice president of the United States has it just about wrapped up in the competence department. And that's the kind of competence we need as we move onward. Our party looks to the future, a future of continued growth, a future of expanded opportunity, a future of peace. And after watching the debate the other night, I know the Bush quail ticket will continue the policies of peace and prosperity that have, as Dan said, made this great nation the envy of the world. I hear some people say we've grown complacent, that it's time for a change. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are the change. We began it eight years ago. Let me talk a little about that change. We're in the 71st straight month of economic recovery. We've been dedicated to slashing taxes and liberating the American economy from the regulations and confiscations of the malaise years. Let me speak a second about those regulations. When I came in and sat in that Oval Office, one of my first chores was to name George Bush as the chairman of a committee to get into how we could reduce and eliminate many of the federal regulations. Where was George? He was in charge of that commission that today we estimate that today, the regulations that have been reduced 
have resulted in a savings of 600 million man hours a year that no longer have to be applied to government required paperwork. When we came into office, families everywhere were reeling from tax rates that were sapping this nation's initiative. We took that money out of the grasping hands of the Washington bureaucrats and put it back in the wallets of the people from whom they confiscated it in the first place, the working men and women of America. The result's been astounding. In the past years, we've seen an explosion of hard work and innovation across this country. People putting their shoulders to the wheel and shifting their entrepreneurial energies into overdrive. And soon the American people will be investing in a new option for the American engine. I call it the George Bush turbocharger. <laughs> and when that happens, all I can say is, put the pedal to the metal and watch America go. We've been doing some work, too, and we don't just talk, we deliver. We've gone to work on our judicial system, appointing serious-minded judges who respect the Constitution and know the meaning of the word punishment. Violent crime has fallen significantly since 1981 because we put America's crooks on notice. Make a false move, and the next sound you hear is the clang of a jail cell slamming shut. We've gone to work on our nation's defenses, we're once again respected in the world. Our armed forces are strong, and America is at peace. We and our NATO allies stood firm when government intermediate-range nuclear missiles were pointed at the heart of Europe and Asia. And Mr. Gorbachev got the message. He did business because he knew we meant business, and we still mean business. America has traveled such a remarkable distance in the last eight years that the memory has faded of the economic and foreign policy crises that we faced when Vice President Bush and I took office. The liberals are singing the same song now they sang then, and it sure isn't, don't worry, be happy. <laughs> it's more like, please worry, be miserable. <laughs> you remember the misery index? You get it by adding the rate of unemployment to the rate of inflation. Jimmy Carter invented it as a stick to beat Jerry Ford with in 1976. Well, during my predecessor's term, that index rose from 13.4% in 1976 to 21% in 1980. And you know, he never brought it up in the 1980 election. I did. My friends, today it's less than 10 percent, and it's been shrinking faster than Walter Hudson, that 1,200-pound man in New York who just lost 700 pounds. <laughs> now, if only we could get Congress to follow Walter's example and cut the fat out of their diet. And I want you to know what I'm talking here about this. There are four of your congressmen I know here in the audience, and we want them back in Washington, and present company is accepted from the things that I'm saying right here. I think we ought to put Congress on a diet, a diet called the line item veto and the balanced budget amendment. Yes, today we have peace and prosperity, and the liberals are trying to pretend those economic and foreign policy nightmares they gave us never happened. Well, they may think they've thrown the past down the memory hole, but there's a reason why the Republican symbol is an elephant. An elephant never forgets. And when you're talking about the Malaise years, let me assure you the liberals, or let me assure the liberals, I should say, that I haven't forgotten, and you haven't forgotten, and they can be sure the American people haven't forgotten either. Still, you can hardly blame the liberals for trying to tell the country about how terrible everything is. After all, what issues do they have to run on? Take defense. 
They opposed the buildup of the military. They opposed the deployment of the missiles in Europe. They opposed the liberation of Grenada. They opposed the raid on Libya. They oppose our policy of helping freedom fighters advance the cause of liberty around the world. George and I did all those things, and I'll tell you how proudly right now we'd both do every one of them over again. <laughs> Take crime. The liberals oppose the death penalty. They oppose it absolutely and in every case. We have fought to protect the noble men who protect us, and that means the death penalty for these vicious killers. If you ask me, there are no Americans braver and no citizens more precious than the men and women who guard us, our state and local police. Amen. And we say that a crack dealer with a machine gun who murders a police officer in the line of duty should give up his life as his punishment. Now take the economy. The liberals opposed our tax cuts, our tax reform efforts, our economic program that slashed interest rates in half and put America back to work. That's the trend I'm most proud of. And that's what I see in this great state where the unemployment rate has fallen by a staggering 30% in just nine months. And there's something else, something you don't often read in the newspapers. Today, more Americans are at work and the highest proportion of our labor force is employed than ever before in the history of this country. And job for job, the jobs we've created in our expansion pay better than the jobs that existed before our expansion began. How did we do it? by getting government out of the way and letting the American people do their thing, their stuff. You know, in my job, I visit many schools and factories, farms and communities around our country, and I get to see why our nation is so strong. Again and again, I find myself remembering what General George C. Marshall said when he was asked why he was so confident that we would win the Second World War. Well, he said, we have a secret weapon the best blankety-blank kids in the whole world. Well, um, well, in our economy, we too have a secret weapon, the best blankety-blank men and women in the whole world. They're those kids that grew up since then. Yes, Michigan and America are going gangbusters. The liberals are saying that they want to help the American middle class. And what they're planning to do for the American middle class is to tax them and tax them and then tax them some more. Well, if you ask me, the liberals are selling the middle class short. Every time the liberals see a problem, they think a big government program run by bureaucrats in Washington is the solution. The same bureaucrats who do so much to stifle individual initiative and economic growth. Well, I say if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And the problem is big spending. The solution is so simple, only a liberal could miss it. We, <laughs> we just have to spend less. What we've learned from hard experience that big spending is as seductive as anabolic steroids. And I think it's time the big spenders were disqualified. We can accomplish that by giving George Bush what he needs to do the job. A new Congress, a better Congress, a Republican Congress. Let me just say something about that. In this campaign, coming from one side, I'm getting sick and tired of hearing about my seven years of deficit spending. The President of the United States can't spend a dime. Only the Congress can spend money. And, uh, and if we want to talk about the deficit and the Congress and all, in the last 58 years, the House of Representatives has been run by the other party 54 of those 58 years. And 48 of those 58 years, 
they've had both houses of the Congress. And in the 50 years that ended in 1980, there had only been eight years in which the budget had been balanced. And when some of us went public and complained about that and the deficit spending, we were told it was part of the Keynesian theory and it was necessary to maintain our prosperity. Well, you know, they left out one part of the Keynesian theory. It's true, he did say, deficit spending by government, if need be, in times of recession, to bring back the economy and stimulate the economy. But then he said, as soon as you've done that, you pay off the deficit and get back to balanced budgets. That's the part they neglected. But to have the Congress so dominated, that's not checks and balances. The Democratic presidents in these last 58 years, they've all had, except for a four-year period, Republican Congresses. The Republican, or Democratic Congresses, what am I saying? <laughs> and the Republican presidents in all of these years. They've only had Republican Congress for two of their years, and that was two years during Ike Eisenhower's term. So you've all got to do everything you can here in Michigan, and that means getting out our message for a tough-as-nails guy who's running a tough-as-nails race and will make a great senator, Jim Dunn. What it all comes down to is a clash of principles, of values, and of visions. The liberals look at this country and see problems, woes, gloom, and doom. And you know that's the kind of thinking that can turn into a self-fulfilling prophecy. We look at this country and we see expanded opportunities, a glorious future, a future in which this nation is strong, protected by land and sea and air, and yes, space, courtesy of the Strategic Defense Initiative. We're confident that we're right. We're confident that our cause is just. So let us go then. Let's take our message of optimism to every man, woman, and child across this great state and across this great nation. Let them know that a vote for us is a vote for peace, a vote for prosperity, and yes, a vote for the future. And let them know that we are the change and that change will continue if the people go to the polls and do what they should and vote for that ticket of ours and for our House of Representatives, the congressmen who are here, for our senatorial candidates, and put us, continue us in charge of this recovery that has been going on. And it is the longest sustained recovery in the history of the United States. So, so I thank you and I thank again that citizen that you honor here tonight, Max Fisher. Thank you very much and God bless you all. Ladies and gentlemen, please, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor to be here. Ladies and gentlemen, well, 
Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, I think it's a great honor for all of us to have with us. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Look, I'm having a great deal of trouble in making out or hearing the things that you're saying. You obviously feel very strongly about them. I don't know just what you've been saying. But I don't think it's fair to subject all of these people to this. Why don't you write what you've been saying in a letter and send it to me or contact me and I would be very happy to answer your question. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, let me say this. Hines, I'm going to have a few words to say about you later. But now I want to thank President Reagan for this great honor, coming here on my birthday and honoring me. But really, he honors all of you. He honors you because you supported him all through 80, 84, and you're going to support George Bush in 1988. So he can be back and talk to you. <laughs> President Reagan. You know, the, there's a fellow running for president who always talks about his being the son of an immigrant. Well, I happen to be a son of an immigrant, and I'm proud to be here, and proud to have a tribute paid to me by the greatest president of the United States. It's a real honor and a pleasure for you. You know, the, uh, I have to tell you a story. You know, we've talked about peace, prosperity, Hines has referred to it, the president. Everything he said, we know is 100% true. And all we hope, that President Bush will be elected to carry on the great traditions and the great principles that President Reagan set out for us in 1980. Now, I don't want to bore him, but I've got to tell a little story about him. I've got to tell a story about a prophet. He doesn't know that many years ago he was prophesied to be a president. And I must tell you this because it's an incident that happened to me. In 1976, I was soliciting funds for President Ford and I wrote a letter. And on the back of this letter was a note. It says, Dear Max, my father has died. We've moved our ranch from Wickenburg to New Mexico. But I want to tell you why I can't support you. Because President Reagan, I mean, Mr. Reagan is my favorite. My father spent countless hours with him when he was making a picture in 1947 at a ranch in Wickenburg. And he said to me, Pat, someday this man will be the President of the United States. And he was a prophet, and that's what took place. Are you kidding? <laughs> yeah, I got you. Now, just one last note. Here's a man of real compassion. You know, I've been in the papers lately about talking about our opponents over there about some of their policies. I want to tell you the kind of man that President Reagan is. He's a man that abhors racism and bigotry and anti-Semitism, all of us. But I must tell you where he got that. He got that from his father. If you don't mind, I'd like to tell this story. His father was a shoe salesman traveling around in Illinois. And one day, he went up to a hotel and registered a little hotel in a snowstorm. And he signed his name to the register. And the man looked at it and he says, Mr. Reagan, we're happy to have you here. We're not happy to tell you we don't have any Jews. And with that, Mr. Reagan said to him, this is no place for me. And he went out in his car and slept in the snowstorm. And this is where this tradition of anti-Semitism, bigotry, all these things abhor. He's a wonderful human being. He has compassion and understanding for people. And that's one of the greatest tributes he has. Oh, you know, I know One last. World, will this happen again while I'm here? 
and I've always been grateful to him for that wonderful message and the feeling and the spirit that came out from him because he was crying when he said it. God bless you, President Reagan. We're so happy you've been here. It's an honor, and you honor us. And all I can say this, uh, this moment I'll remember all my life. Now, I don't know whether I have as many years ahead as I have back. Whatever it is, it's a very important moment for me. And I must say to you, God bless you, and let you live, as they say, to 120. Thank you. <laughs>